It was serendipitous that we met each other, training during the day, performing at night, developing a new act. I wasn't expecting to have a career basing, that's for sure. When Hamo started his pole dancing, it was an incredible thing to see because it just went woof, so quickly. It always smashed it. My name's Hamish. Uh, I'm from Australia. I'm currently an acrobatic pole dancer. Previous to that, I did a hand-to-hand -hand act with Dennis uh, called The English Gents. My name's Dennis. I'm as Australian bogan as they come and I perform a soap bubble act in the show Opium. We met in Japan when we did a contract together at Tokyo Disney. I was from Sydney originally, Dennis was from Melbourne. We met on the day that we arrived. I was sort of like winding up my acrobatic career that had never really taken off at that point. Really? Yeah. You were in a similar, similar headspace, I think. Are you kidding me? I was like 23. Yeah, yeah, but you had a, didn't you have a knee injury? People were saying that you were selling out for taking a job. Oh yeah, absolutely. I was doing it for the money. Yeah, yeah. We bonded over karaoke and beer. Oh yeah. In our we spare time. That. We did lots of that. Had a great time. Lost a lot of brain cells. But loved every minute of it. But in our spare time in between shows, we trained hand to hand, we trained acrobatics together. Yeah, Hamish came from sports acrobatics. Yeah. And he was a gun flyer. I had never really done basing before. I went to a circus school and did other other disciplines. But then you said give a give basing a go. Yeah. And it's ironic it's the thing I never ever did. Well, they tried, to, they, ended up doing. they tried to make you do basing at circus school, didn't they? Didn't yeah. some of the teachers want you to be a base? Yeah, but that, no, it's like, you do all the work. <laughs> yeah, all the hard yeah, work. The base, the base does all the work all the and the fly gets all the glory. While we were training together in Japan, we were wondering what we were going to do with this. Our lives in Australia were sort of like put on pause. And so we were wondering, do we go back to what our lives were? before we went to Japan. I was studying building studies in the evening and managing cafes during the day. Dennis was working in a service station at night <laughs> on a circus stall during the day. Yeah, yeah, and prospects then... were high. A lot of my friends were in jail. <laughs> it was looking good for me. <laughs> then uh, Dennis said, let's see how far we can take this. Come stay with me, we'll train like monks and we'll see how far we can take it. And I was really touched by that. So we did that and we put a very cliche, I want to say, act together. And we just weren't having much success. At the time, we were, I was proud of it, but looking back, it was pretty <laughs> mediocre. So out of desperation, we decided to busk. We didn't want to do it as ourselves. We had to invent these characters because you really have to put yourself out there You've got to engage the audience, make them stop, then make them watch the whole show, then make them pay afterwards. There were some crazy ideas that we had. We arrived on the English Gents and the act started to sort of write itself. The ideas really, really flowed. When it came to doing a show, I got too scared. And like I said, Dennis, you have to do all the talking. I remember, yeah, you were reluctant to do it initially. I I'm was. Right, let's go, we'll be yeah, right, we'll yeah. figure it out. And we desperately had no choice. <laughs> we <laughs> we went, needed money. We went to a thrift store. We That's bought right. three piece suits that yeah. were oversized. Yeah. And Dennis figured out how to drive the sewing machine. That's right. Stitched Velcro so down, the, down the seams of the legs so yeah. that it would, so the clothes would tear away. Our first kind of circus contract came about, we hadn't been street performing that long, only a few months in yeah. Melbourne. Yep. There was a show that was just starting to absolutely take off called Le Clique and it was playing in the Spiegel tent there and that had David O'Meara in it, the bathtub, Frodo, all these other really seasoned great performers. So we walked up to this Spiegel tent and said, we're um, street performers, can we do a spot in tonight or something? And the creative producer of yep. the show said, come watch the show tonight and then afterwards you can do a spot. And we're like, oh, this is great, this is fantastic. Oh my God, we got invited to a show. <laughs> we're so lucky. And then so we went and watched this show, which was just phenomenal show. like. Our eyes were like, Whoa! We'd, we'd never seen anything we'd like it before. Never seen anything like it before, yeah. And then we got to do our spot. We had a good reception, especially kind of the finale. It's got a great response from the audience. It, it went really well, and they said, you need to shorten it. 
into a stage version on a small one meter stage. Yeah. It needs to be 10 minutes and then come and do a spot in the show, in the clique. And we're like, what? So for a long time, we would busk and do shows in the evening with La Clique. And in between seasons, we would do street performing festivals. You coined the phrase, it's like we found a glitch in the matrix where we get paid to do something that we love doing. Yeah, it's just like really lucky, very yeah. fortunate. Right place, the right time. While we were performing the English Dance Act, we didn't have to train it or concentrate on it. So that gave us room to develop our solo acts. Pole dancing was becoming a brand new sport and it was taken out of the context of strip clubs and it was becoming a legitimate art form. And I thought if a guy could do something like that on that apparatus and make it look masculine, that would be really outside of the box. I had a, a very clear idea of what kind of act that I wanted to do. I wanted to subvert the fact that it was a pole by putting a lamppost on top and anchoring it to that iconic singing in the rain moment. Yeah, you smashed that out of the park from the beginning, I remember. Yeah, that was nice. an incredible thing to see. I was like, whoa, Hamo is on to something. When we were working with David, he was competing in skydiving competitions. When his bath act wasn't in the show, I felt like there was, there was a gap in the show. And I thought, maybe my pole dancing act can fill that void when he's away. Then when he comes back, his bath act can go in the show. And my act is very much influenced by his, by his act. And I didn't expect that we could ever exist in the same show. Very different apparatuses, but with a very similar intention. I'm thrilled to bits that we can actually exist in the same show and, and the audience and the producers don't say, they're too similar. My solo act I do now came about unintentionally. We were going away on tour all the time and I had just had a baby girl. I was worried that I would have no relationship with her. We were in a Kmart and she bumped her head on the trolley thing and she started crying and I just grabbed the closest thing to me and it was one of those bubble kids bubble wands and I like pulled it open I'm like here you go here's ready and I'm blowing bubbles I'm like yeah and she stopped crying and she was just like mesmerized by them. You know, later on I thought, you know, what if I learn to do some bubble tricks and I'll kind of channel all of that missing her into kind of concentrating on that and I'll come back from tour and I'll show her these things and she'll love them and we'll have this great moment and she'll anchor all those good memories with dad, she'll know that that's dad. I started messing around with it, I started developing my own solution, I became quite obsessed with it and, and obsessed with the science behind it. It was just fascinating me and started manipulating them in different ways. I took that back to my daughter. I start blowing the bubbles and straight away she just wanted to pop them. I'm like, all right, hang on a sec, you gotta wait and let me do it so I can show you. And then I'll be doing it again and she just run up laughing, trying to pop them, I'm trying to keep them away from her. She wasn't interested in the slightest of these things that I'd spent so long developing. So I ended up just having a great time and just blowing bubbles for her. And... But in that whole process of learning all of that, I'd be practicing at like three in the morning in this little hotel bathroom and I'd get a knock on the door and it would be the other circus performers in the show. Say, hey, hey, you doing bubbles? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, can we watch? I'm like, yeah, sure. And they'd all pile into this bathroom and I'd be doing these shapes and geometric shapes and things like that. And they'd be like, whoa. And that's when I realized, you know, adults are kind of into it. And that's kind of where the act started. I have a bit of a passion for science. So I wanted to incorporate my deep interest in that and try to present it in a way that would be interesting to people who might not be interested in the science behind bubbles. The outside surface of it, the gases on the inside, the way they behave with the atmosphere. But in the end, I don't think it's any of that. To me, it, it represents something that you can't hold on to. You just get a, you get a moment with it and then it's gone. But you've got to make the most of that moment. The bubble could be gone any second. So you have to really be in the moment and appreciate the beauty of it. Yeah. It's Cyril, and keeping all those balls in the air is what he does so well. Currently, 
we have Spartan Imperial Mansions. It's just a trashed trailer. And I will be taking that claw and taking it apart. This thing had no resistance at all. It basically felt like I was tearing through paper. Because he can't hear me in there. It's very loud. There's lots of crushing noises happening. Park the tractor! Park the tractor right now! Something's spewing out of the tractor! I'm so excited for the Spartan Mansions to get fully refurbished and come back to Nipton. They're a luxury uh, caravan unit that was made in the 50s. We have quite a few of them here on the property. Ross's plans with the Spartan Imperial Mansions are really to make them a luxury stay. We're really hoping to renovate these into beautiful masterpieces. There's one caravan in particular that doesn't quite match the quality of what those are. We've been trying to get this caravan taken away. We tried to sell it and that didn't work. So we tried to give it away for free and that didn't work. It is the biggest eyesore. It could lead to infestations. It really needs to go. To give you kind of context, when we first showed up, there was about six to eight guys living in there who all work at the mines. So uh, it was really key to get it cleaned up and get it out of here. important since we're going to destroy it to make sure that we have enough room all the way around it and we can get to it from all angles. We also don't want to cause a lot of rubble and stuff around where our residents are and that way we can keep our residents protected. You may have noticed the giant X on the trailer. It's not from us. We didn't put it there. I don't know what it symbolizes. It's definitely not for buried treasure, but it does mark the spot we're going to try to hit. Took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> My role today is to really be the eyes on the ground. I keep an eye on the tractor and the trailer to make sure everything is going appropriately, to make sure nothing goes wrong. Today I'm gonna to take that backhoe, I'm gonna tear that caravan apart. Hopefully nothing goes wrong, fingers crossed. extremely surprised with how easy this thing is coming apart. We've torn down other buildings before and other walls and this stuff is just crumbling and just shredding. Frank is having the best time crushing this trailer. If I can tell he's giddy by going smash, 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 smash. In the instance of ripping and tearing, uh, I made a bit of a boo-boo. Uh, I went to lift the trailer up so I could separate the subfloor from the actual trailer frame, and in so doing, did not realize that there's part of that frame that came down and speared my radiator. A radiator on a big piece of machinery is incredibly important because it keeps everything cool, and if you don't have coolant going through your motor, especially with hydraulics and that kind of equipment, it's a very bad situation. You can crack the block and the whole thing's a paperweight. Park the tractor right now. Something's spewing out of the tractor. Lower the bucket. It's yellow and it's shooting out the front. Walk away for a minute. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, we'll walk away. So what happened was when he lifted up the, the trailer, we're trying to rip off the wood from this frame and one of these angle pieces came down and hit our radiator. A lot of the time with nice trailers or modern trailers, what they'll have is a piece of metal all the way along the edge here. So you don't actually have this. We didn't know this was here until it came crashing down into our tractor. Sound good, Frank? That's, that's it. Okay. <sighs> that sucks. Yep. It's a good time to take lunch. Yeah. <laughs> That really sucks. Unfortunately for the project, it means that this is now gonna be delayed until we can get this fixed. Being down the tractor really makes a big impact on our timeline. I, no. I don't think Frank made a mistake. It's really more of an accident. I do not feel she is making any excuses. I think she is spot on. So I'm gonna use the cat instead. I'm still gonna need to use it to clean up the area and put everything in the dumpster. I'm definitely concerned because you never wanna run a piece of machinery with no coolant. Uh, 
However, it has had a few hours to cool off and we're just crossing the road with it. If the brakes don't lock up or the power steering goes out, this should be fairly simple, but as we learned today, anything can happen. So it might be difficult to move the tractor because unless it's on, it has an automatic electric brake. So it means you essentially kind of have to run it, but uh, hopefully with no load and being very quickly, we can get it over here across the street as quickly as we can with minimal temperature increase. It's important to communicate with your partner in more ways than one. <laughs> a little bit harder than I thought getting yanked about by the caterpillar in the tractor. We managed to get it in place and it's in a good spot. Today I actually feel like it went pretty well. We managed to completely destroy the trailer and uh, we just have to do a little bit of cleanup now. I am so glad that that caravan is not in Nifton anymore. It's no longer an issue. Can't have infestation, can't have a fire. It not being here it just takes a lot of worry out of the whole thing. I can't wait for the Spartan Imperial Mansions to show back up because it's really going to class the whole place up. We're going to have luxury units and it will truly be a jewel of an oasis here in the desert. What are we making today? We're making pasta a la norma. A little bit about a la norma is that it is a tomato-based sauce with stewed eggplant. Those of you that are kind of eggplant averse, keep your mind open. This is like, in my opinion, the greatest way to eat eggplant. It becomes this like kind of creamy, jammy eggplant situation. A note, salt the shit out of your pasta water. It's a non-negotiable, like the shit out of it. it. Should taste like the ocean. Saltier than the ocean, it should taste like the Dead Sea. So the base of this sauce is our eggplant. So what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna cube it up and then you're gonna salt it pretty heavily and that's gonna draw out a ton of moisture. So I did this probably an hour ago. We're getting it to soak up all the good stuff from the tomato and the basil. So we've salted and we've drained our eggplant. We are gonna go over here and we're gonna start building our sauce. So hot pan, a little bit of olive oil. I like to throw in a little bit of butter. It is delicious. It adds like a little extra level of creaminess to the dish. The eggplant has a tendency to be like a little bit bitter. So we're gonna use a couple little secret things to help counterbalance that. So we're gonna add our eggplant into the pan and we're just gonna kind of sear it off. You want the pan to be kind of ripping hot at this point. When you put the eggplant in, it should give a, a pretty good sizzle. Not so crazy because it's got some water left in it that you know, you burn your house down. We're trying to go for like a nice caramelization on the outside of this eggplant. We are going to take the eggplant out of the pan and then we're gonna start building the aromatic to the sauce. Uh, and then we'll reintroduce the eggplant later. So you're gonna see it start to change color a little bit. It's definitely gonna soften up. Some of the edges will get like a little, little GBD, golden brown and delicious. It's the foundation to this kitchen, is the GBD. All right, yeah, we're getting close here. Pop that eggplant out of the pan. Crank in a little extra EVOO. Throw in some sliced garlic. This is one of those choose your own adventure things. If you're a garlic girl, go crazy. We've got our finely minced shallots and our garlic in the pan. And just add a little bit of butter the end of summer, right? <laughs> to get a little bit more of that condensed tomato flavor, I'm popping in a tablespoon, tablespoon of tomato paste. And we're just gonna fry this up a little bit to cook out some of that, any of that raw tomato flavor. We're gonna add in our tomato sauce. This is only whole peeled tomatoes. A little bit of olive oil, a little bit of salt. All right, we're gonna cook that down for just a minute or so. Let kind of all those flavors live together and then we're gonna add back our eggplant, stew that together for a while, and then we're gonna add a couple little secret ingredients. We're gonna reintroduce our eggplant um, and we're gonna let that kind of stew down and get nice and soft and delicious. A really good trick to adding balance to your pasta sauces or really anything is adding some acidic ingredients. These are pickled Hungarian goat horn peppers. So I'm gonna go in with these just, 
is Bad Boys Hole. These are just gonna add a little extra acid, a little extra depth to the sauce. And we're just gonna kinda let this stew. I'm gonna throw in a couple of these Gorgina opal basil leaves. Why not? Some parsley and lemon zest. Freshly zested is key. Quarter of a lemon and then toss that all together. We are adding our pasta to our water that is at a rolling boil. We have to zhuzh it. Zhuzh. We are going to get this sauce back front and center. This sauce has thickened up a lot. We're gonna use a lot of that pasta water to thin it out a little bit. So we're gonna drain our pasta water, our pasta directly into the sauce and we are going to thin it out. All right, if you were a civilized human being, you'd be using pasta tongs, but I never claim to be such. So we're just gonna pop this directly in the bowl, a little Roustico style. This is definitely uh, serving for two very hungry people. A little bit of pecorino for a little bite, some basil oil, some chives, and a couple little leaves of this Gorgina opal basil. And let's see who's outside that I can go test this on. Paper for a second? Yeah. Are you hungry? Mm. <laughs> That's really good. You like it? Yes. Cool. Wow. Like a little bit of everything. Mm hmm. Love the kick of the spice. Mm hmm. I'm a fan. Good. Happiness. Satisfaction, mm -hmm. excitement. <laughs> it's like a whole lot going on in my mouth right now. <laughs> but it's good. Good. Love it. Oh, does this make you want to dance? This makes me want to sleep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. After yeah. show meal, mm -hmm. for sure. Glass wine, a little red, red sauce. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect combination. I am not normally a fan of eggplant, mm -hmm. but in this dish. You're digging it? I'm digging it. Okay, it's cool. It's a go, it's a go. Yeah, 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 Got yeah. Got the thumbs up. Eggplant's one of those things that people can be kind of iffy about. Yeah. So you have to kind of yes. sneak it in there. Was it the perfect texture? Yeah. yeah. It's time to KO. Yeah, it's beauty rest time, people. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it's very traumatic to fall and to get injured. In our unicycle, there's a smoke machine, which has a battery. So the whole thing is like all chromed and tubes and stuff. So they made a very light unicycle into a very heavy one. There was one incident where the unicycle fell off the stage and this lady just caught it, the hero that night. She <laughs> prevented a major accident. We're there to make them safe and to make the act secure and go on night after night. It's a big responsibility, but also it's just part of the job. It's part of the, the role that we have. My name's Alana. I'm from the UK and I do sway poles in absinthe. My name is Phil. I'm from Quebec City, Canada, and I am a unicyclist on absinthe. I got into circus because I was a gymnast all my life. I started training as a gymnast from the age of five and I competed for my country, became European champion in 2011 and third in the world 2012. And then six months after, I got approached by a company and then went on tour. I ran away with the circus and I was then getting paid to do what I love rather than paying to do what I love. It was a dream come true. I started doing circus when I was pretty young. My dad pretends to be uh, the first one in Quebec City to own a unicycle. And I say pretend because it's full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually they bought me a unicycle and I was that weird kid doing unicycle going to the grocery store and corner store. And eventually they signed me up to the circus school in Quebec City. So when I was 13 years old, I started doing street performance with another guy, Gabriel, which is also now a professional circus artist. And we were the two little kids doing street performance and eventually did the professional degree in Quebec City. That was my kind of upbringing to uh, becoming a professional circus artist. So I, I studied in circus. My main discipline is sports acrobatics, which I also do in absinthe. We do the trio as well as sway poles. 
And when I was on another show, I also learned sway poles. So I kind of had a bit of an experience before joining Absinthe of how to use a sway pole and how to work it. A porter essentially is, is the base, is the one on the floor supporting other people, other acrobats. We both have the same skill sets. We're on the ground throwing people, holding them, lifting. I guess we did kind of try to do an act together, but it wasn't that much of a success. The reality is that we both need little people to... To lift. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we met on Instagram and through friends of friends, they were trying to get us together for a long time. And we officially first met in Vegas. So we were both on tour, so both different tours. And we were here in Vegas for five days, went on dates every day. And then she went back on tour in Russia, and I went back on tour in New Jersey. So I really wanted to go see her and get out of New Jersey. Made it happen, got to Moscow, and then uh, stayed with her for a week, and left uh, less of a single man. Yeah, we continued to do long distance touring for two years, until the pandemic hit. We actually bought a house in Vegas January 2020, just before the pandemic. I hadn't worked for Spiegel World yet, but we were speaking and I knew this was an option. There was no definite timeline when we bought the house here in Vegas. It was a bit of a gamble, so I decided to come gamble in Vegas. <laughs> so during the pandemic, we created this garment printing company to supply the clothing company that we had. So together we bought the equipment, during the pandemic when we weren't earning any money, we were like, let's spend a lot of money on this equipment and let's see how it goes. And we started selling online, on Etsy, on smaller platforms and helping other smaller brands. And it became very successful. How many fit on a 18, eight by 11? Look at that. Is that? Some personal. 20. Okay. Towards the end of the pandemic, we were like, okay, this is getting too big for our house. We had it all in one bedroom to start with. And so then we bought a studio space where we have our two businesses now in the front as well as a photography studio in the back. Being able to supply for other people, being able to help other people is something that we strive off of. Yeah, our structure is unique in a way because we're not stressed financially. The drive is to create and not necessarily to become rich. So we grew a lot our social media platforms and stuff just to try things and, and present our art, but differently. And then I think we started a little competition. The competition was just to see who could get the most followers, who could get to 10,000 first, and then and he got to 10,000, and I was like, okay, 20,000, and then he went up to 200,000. I was like, okay, yeah, game, you win. I'll give you this one. <laughs> <laughs> he grew a big following on Instagram at first, <laughs> and then TikTok arrived, and then we started understanding this new platform, and started focusing on learning how to create content for these platforms and understanding what the followers wanted to consume. And we see something on TikTok or Instagram, we're like, oh, we could do that, but let's make it more us. Hey, I think we mastered it now. <laughs> you look so much smaller. Like, <laughs> you're sweating. No, it's good enough. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> I don't know. I've got changed. Okay, great. Cute. Nice. You got it. The best part about posting on social media is it, that kind of attention for me. I, I know I need it. It's got a thousand views already. I'm a bit of an attention and it's not treatable, we know. And so we just go with it. Sharing those other skills and other ideas and other businesses that we have help our followers to understand who we are in, in the bigger picture. I guess what we find fun about it now is especially because we have our own photography studio, like creating in our own space. I don't know, it keeps the creativity there off stage as well as on stage. Yeah, we love the possibilities and it's, it's kind of endless, you know, what you can create. So it's nice to be able to have that outlet. We grow together, we build together and we're constantly evolving. Um, when I was approached by Spiegel World, 
I remember exactly, it was January 1st. And we were both hungover, and we got the text and it was kind of, oh wow, okay, this is amazing, this is finally happening. I mean, it was such an amazing feeling, already knowing that Phil was working with Spiegel World, to be joining the same show, the same, like we'd been wanting to get on the same show for a long time, to have the same schedule, so when they approached me, I was so excited. I was straight away, I was like, yeah, I'm available, I'm here, I'm ready to go, I can start tomorrow. <laughs> And to be fair, like she was definitely the best option for the, for this role. So Alana was, you know, Phil's wife. Suddenly things were gonna shift a little bit. Rather than being Phil's wife and no one really knows what I'm capable of, for them to be able to see what I'm capable of and like, oh, okay, she's she's talented too. It's not just him. I stand my own ground. <laughs> For me, there's a big difference when I was on a touring show compared to being on Absinthe, is that the audiences are so much closer. That much of an intimacy, it does affect our performance and it makes it more unique night after night because you get to actually have these interactions. So there's something magical about being able to connect with them directly and feed off them. For me, where I see similarities is from street performance. I, when I was on the street and you know, gathering a crowd and I really got to connect with my audience and now I kind of see this same kind of interaction with the audience, which I really enjoy and it's a fun little thing to be able to improvise with them. Yeah, and I think it just makes it more enjoyable for the artist and the audience, the closer you are, because they each get a more unique experience together. However many times we do the show, the people in the audience are seeing it for the first time. I get to do what I love, and it's our way of expressing our emotions and putting a smile on someone else's face. And there's nothing that beats it. It's what I've always dreamed of doing. I never feel like I'm working. <laughs> Grab your shakers, it's cocktail time. Now I am really excited about making this cocktail. It is called the Sakura Maro. It uses things like avoa amburana, made in Brazil. It's a rum made from sugarcane juice and it's aged in amburana wood, as well as Bowles Geneva, which is a Dutch spirit. It's a juniper flavored mixture of malt wines. Enough talking, let's get to it, shall we? First, we're gonna grab our shaker. We're gonna add half an ounce of agave syrup. Next, we're gonna add half an ounce of avoa amburana. Three quarters of an ounce of fresh squeezed lemon juice. Three quarters of our Peruvian brandy, Pisco. As well as three quarters of an ounce of Bulls Geneva. The weirdest ingredient of them all, a green tea sweet yogurt. One ounce. Now we're gonna grab our glass, fill it with crushed ice, as well as only one cube of ice into the shaker for a quick shake. And it's simple as pouring it over ice. We're gonna top it off with just a little more crushed ice, give it a little dome. And last but not least, we're gonna grab a microplane zester and add our garnish, which is lime zest. And that is a Sakura Maru. Now we made the drink, now we need somebody to taste it. Who better than my favorite drinking buddy, Gypsy. Gypsy. Nico! I got something for you. Oh! Give it a little taste. Okay. See what happens. Looks good. Now there's some Brazilian cachaça. Oh. Wow. Pisco. Wow, it's, it's uh, tastes healthy. It's healthy, <laughs> yeah. The lime is just so... <sighs> Energy. Effervescence, it's electric. It's like green energy. It's like green energy. I would have named it if I knew how to spell it. Oh, I feel I feel the same way. 
it looks like seaweed as well. It does look like seaweed. I, I would put a little mermaid, like just hanging off. Like... Can we get a mermaid? <laughs> Hello, sailor. It's Jack and Reed here to check the rigging. They are definitely able-bodied seamen. Catch them at the hook in Atlantic City. Right now, it's time to check in with Frank and Alex who are picking up the pieces after Frank got a little overzealous on their last project. As you may know, we accidentally uh, broke the backhoe when we were destroying the single wide mobile home not too long ago. and. We had a piece of that impale through the evaporator condenser here, and even worse, it managed to dent the oil cooler right behind it. And since these parts are really tough to get a hold of, because this is an older machine, we had to go aftermarket, but we finally got them installed, and they came out and charged up the AC, so we're back in business. Besides, without a good hoe, how's Jim supposed to bury bodies in the desert? <laughs> No. <laughs> I, I can dig it. In a previous episode of Circus Town, Liana Walenda shared her incredible story following her near fatal high wire accident. That story generated so much interest in wire walking, we asked Liana back to teach us the basics. Come on in, guys. Stay in there. All right. That's Ray. That's Choo Choo with the ball. Come on, Chewy. Leia's a little scruffy one. And Rosie just got a haircut. <laughs> oh, now you're gonna burn. This is Mario. Mario came with the house when I bought the house. <laughs> this is Mango. I've had him for 20 years. He's my firstborn. I always say, hi. Walking the wire is sort of like riding a bike for me. I can always walk a wire, but I'm not gonna be in my best shape unless I keep up the skill. Especially after the accident, it's a little harder. So it's good to keep up condition here and there. There's different techniques. My technique is that I like to touch my toe on the wire and slide it a little bit into the step rather than stomping down, or rather than putting your foot fully down because I wanna know for sure that my foot is in the right spot before I transfer my weight. I usually look at the end of the wire where I'm going. I'm not looking down at my feet. I'm looking at my destination. It's also important to hold the balancing pole in the right way. You, you always wanna curl your wrists. You don't wanna have your arms down like that. You wanna hold the pole up just above your belly button. Curl your wrist, elbows in. And when I'm training someone new, I say to kind of imagine that the center of the pole is screwed into your belly and the pole moves up and down from there. There's none of this sideways motion because then your body's gonna move to counterbalance. You're usually holding people above you on a bar on your shoulders and you have to stay rock solid so you don't move the bar above you. So it's super important to have really strong biceps and balance with just your arms. And so, Often training is just doing laps back and forth several times so you build that strength in your arms. You don't just do it once. You do it three times is usually my rule of thumb. It really is my passion and you kind of forget when you're in the day to day because I love my job at Absinthe as well. 
and you just kind of get the hustle and the bustle and getting my kid to school and this and that. And then I come out here and practice and I'm like, oh, this is living. This is, it's silly, but I do. I love the weight of the balancing pole in my hands and all of that. The feeling of the wires sliding across my feet. It really is just, it really is just my passion. me I perceived I lost everything. I had to sell my house that I worked so hard for, my family never got to see it. I'm never going to probably perform again. We've worked so hard to get here. It's a privilege to have this lifestyle but we've given our whole youth to get here. With circus performers a lot of people make that their identity, that you're a circus performer, that's who I am. And you have that industry completely wiped out, you lose who you are. What do I do? I'm Chris Jones, I'm from Durham, England. I'm the flyer for the Geordie Boys and we do hand-to-hand -hand balancing. Uh, my name's Ryan Dury, uh, I'm from Middlesbrough in the United Kingdom and I am the base of the Geordie Boys. Sports acrobatics is basically you have the sprung floor and you use people as your apparatus. I competed in sports acrobatics uh, for Great Britain in the men's pairs division, picked up plenty of medals and that's kind of what sent me to the next phase going into circus. I was uh, men's four, um, so there was four of us in the team, I was the middle, and I came out here uh, to do banking, which was platform work, which is what I did in my group. And my mum was a gymnast, so I started gymnastics, going to preschool gymnastics, and then worked my way through, and then I started to reach a higher level when I moved to DNS, which was the club that we both trained at. Pretty much once a boy walks through the door, it's like you, you, you come here, you're not seeing your parents again, you'll be training. And because I was very small, they're like, you're gonna be a flyer. We had a extremely high level Russian coach come in. And pretty much from that point, I was in the gym seven days a week. There was no days off. Once you're immersed in something so deeply where it's like, that's what you're living and breathing every day, it's very hard to step outside. I mean, as a kid, I always wanted to be a footballer. And then you get to a certain age, you're like, well, that's not an option. That's not even remotely an option. This is what I have. These are the tools I can work with. And I do have the ability to go somewhere after this. I mean, I knew of Chris because I saw him on the wall growing up. There was pictures of Chris around the gym. You know, like he was one of the champion men's pairs in the gym and like that's what we looked up to. And so coming out here, I knew who he was. He didn't know who I was. I'm 10 years his senior. So by the time he got in the gym, I'm long gone. I was already in Cirque over in the States. So it was interesting meeting Chris for the first time because you're like, I've seen you on the wall. Although we're different in age, we still share that same culture. What I find impressive about Ryan is his drive. He's very driven and that energy does rub off on you. I like the fact that we're on the same page, the fact that we're from the same gym, we've had the same coaching. We often don't even need to communicate verbally. We can feel what each other are doing because that's how we've been trained. So that has really helped us kind of accelerate, whereas a lot of people would take years to come together and really like find that gel. Not just doing skills, you're not just on stage, you, you have to spend time out, you have to discuss things, you have to be able to communicate and if there is disagreement, be able to do it adult-like and rationally. Like being married almost, you have a couple of tiffs, but for the most part, it's smooth sailing, it's easy. I mean, Chris has had so much experience with performing. You know, I'm still very new to this industry. I came out here in 2018. This is my second show. I haven't done any freelance work like a lot of performers tend to do. There's always a part of you that misses the competition of sport, getting that appreciation, that applause at the end, the, the gold medal. This is just totally different. This is entertainment, it's not sport. I should come to work and enjoy myself, not be stressed. So like compared to what we used to do in sport, that had the level that what that was, this is smooth sailing, you know? So to an audience member, balancing somebody on your head in a one-arm handstand is crazy. It's how do I make manageable, maintainable skills for 10 shows a week look difficult? And how can I keep that level for years, not for a, for a quick short stint? And that's the difference between sport and what we do now is I get to come to work, have a laugh, enjoy my time, get on stage, entertain people, take them away from 
whatever problems they have in their lives. I would say Spiegel World as a show is a very different show from other shows on the Strip. It has a very different vibe and that's why I think people like it. It's refreshing, it's not traditional circus. It's supposed to be raunchy. It's supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. That's why people like it. And for us, our act is better when you've got those raunchy people in the audience who are screaming. That's where we thrive. Shirts are off, lots of screaming. You don't get drunk bachelorette parties at Spot. That's the difference. <laughs> They're the best ones, drunk bachelorette parties. They are, they are good. When I first got that contract, it's awesome, you know? Like, it's what you've been striving for for so many years, what you've worked hard for. I would say luck has played a massive part in everything for me. I mean, getting to America in the first place is so hard as an international. We have to have the accolades that we've had to be able to get here, to get the visa to qualify to come here. Coming out here at 21 was amazing. I loved the show uh, and that shut during COVID. We knew that once COVID happened in February that this was an option. You know, we knew that the show could close. We knew what that meant for me. To me, I perceived I lost everything. I had to sell my house. I nearly lost my visa. And I knew that if I was to go back to the UK, I would probably not get back out here again. And for our industry, this is where it's at. You know, you can't earn the same money in England as you can do in America in the performing industry. So I married my wife. We went to South Carolina. We relocated, moved everything across the country. I was coaching gymnastics and for me, I was like, I'm never gonna probably perform again. When something like the pandemic happens and you have that industry completely wiped out, you lose who you are. And I never wanted that to happen again. And that's why I got into real estate so I could have something else in my life other than performing. But coming back to Vegas, getting this job, I do love what I do. Like it's, it's an amazing job, it's an amazing career. Uh, we've worked so hard to get here so it makes sense to pursue it. I've been on the roller coaster of ups and downs just in my career. To be able to perform full time, it really is the best. The consistency is something that gets overlooked a lot. It's nice to be able to come in and enjoy yourself at what you do. It's a privilege to have this lifestyle, but we've given our whole youth to get here. It's the same as a doctor giving 10 years to his practice or her practice. It's the same for us. We've dedicated our whole childhood to get this level. and welcome back to Suck -a Size. My name is Lucia and today I'm gonna to be taking you through some exercises for that booty. Are you ready? We're gonna squat and up and down and up. Really feel that burn, down and up. Pushing down and up. Really engaging those butt muscles as you're just pushing back up to the ceiling. Feeling that burn, we love that burn, don't we? Keep it going for me, down and up. And now the burn's going, we're gonna do some toe touches. And two, and three. It's eight. We're just gonna take it a little step further and twist it around, grab that back leg, pull your hand down, really release all of that tension through the legs. You've got this. Doesn't this feel fantastic? Just breathing in, really feeling it and stretch all through the legs. Really release all of that tension through the legs. You've got this. Doesn't this one feel excellent? Nice work, everyone. You guys did an absolutely amazing job. And I'll see you next week with some more circus size. It's Geraldine Philadelphia and her loopy hoops. Developing story. 
The state of California is bracing for something it rarely encounters. Hurricane Hillary is gaining strength in the Pacific and is headed straight for Nipton, California. Just weeks ago, the Mojave was faced with the deadly York Mountain fire and now the potential of life-threatening winds and flood. All eyes are on Nipton, as only a fraction of the hurricane's force could wipe it off the map. So it's been 83 years since the last hurricane. We're a little bit concerned about how much rain is coming down because we have a lot of historical buildings here and with historical buildings, we get a lot of roof leaks. This storm might be really telling on what roofs are holding and which ones aren't. The other thing that we have to consider is the foundations of our buildings. Being as old as they are, any flood water that gets in there can cause serious damage. And last thing any of us want is to lose a historical structure. I think the best thing we can do is get the machines together. We can attack that dirt berm that we've got up. And that way it keeps it from the mud washing into the pond. I think if we just get that up there, I think that's our best bet, just move that dirt. So the hurricane is actually bringing in some thunderstorm weather. The reality is hurricanes are incredibly dangerous. They cause a lot of flooding. A lot of people lose their lives every year. So it's nothing that we take lightly. And we definitely want to try to do something to keep the water from getting into the pond. So we're going to go ahead and bolster the current berm that we have on the upper section of the property. And we're also building a berm around the pond itself so that we can have some sort of higher ground to divert that water. Recently, we've had the New York Mountain fire here in the Mojave Desert and we managed to dodge a huge bullet. I know that there was over 93,000 acres burned with that. There are live serious hazards, you know, to living out here in the desert. We do what we can to stay prepared and do what we can to stop it. We're expecting a lot of winds too and winds can be kind of dangerous. It can blow trees over. Some of these eucalyptus trees are 80 to 100 feet tall, so they can cause a lot of damage when they come down. I feel like Nipton's in pretty good hands, obviously with this being our first hurricane. I mean, you know, anything can happen. Well, we got that done. Guess now we just wait. Yep. That's pretty windy out there. At least we still have power. Well, at least the backup power works. Oh, crap. All right, well, let's figure that one out. Frank. Last time we had a hurricane out here, well, it was before my time. Yeah, like 83 years or something like that. Right, and I'm not that old yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next week. <laughs> next week. <laughs> Did you see the berm we made up by the pond? Yeah, uh, now I know why you put that up there, because <laughs> <laughs> how this all this water is running through here. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy that two weeks ago we had a fire and now we've got flooding. Mm-hmm. A little bit of everything. Oh, yeah. Luckily, we prepared for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was a real good idea. You can see the rain pouring down out there. Never uh, have I seen this much rain. The wildest was that we had hailstones about this size Ooh. down with rain. It must have been about three or four inches deep. Oh my God. And it flooded the walkway on the side of the hotel. Mm -hmm. And the water was actually going underneath that side door. Thank goodness. If we were to dig like a small little culvert trench, per se, and like just lower the ground where it flows away from the hotel toward it, and run that piping you're talking about with yes. all the holes in it, with a little bit of gravel, run it all the way down towards the railroad tracks where our compost area is. Mm -hmm. That would easily take it away from the hotel. We know. just fixed the roof, so keeping the water out would be Not really bad. good. Until next time. Jim has even made a few comments, you know, about the magic of Nipton always seeming to dodge a bullet, first with the yeah. fire and then with the floods. It seems to be just located in that just magical spot in the desert here. Well, the tricky part about those access roads being down at the bottom part of the valley, they do end up getting washed out quite a bit. 
and uh, luckily we're up here on the side slope so it just goes down there but unfortunately it makes getting out of here really difficult if those roads aren't functional it means we have to stay put yeah anything that we can do to preserve these structures will obviously serve Circus Town as a whole and to any performers that come out here they'll be able to enjoy these structures for years to come. There are so many more fabulous Circus Town videos to check out and if you subscribe you'll never miss a trick. Go on, give us a push.